Welcome to Rare On Air, the monthly podcast from Eurodis, Rare Diseases Europe. I am your host, Julian Poulan, and once a month, we will be exploring the challenges, experiences and successes of people who live with a rare condition. In this episode of Rare On Air, we discuss the topic of rare genetic diseases and the potential of gene therapies. 72% of rare diseases are genetic, And so many people from across the rare disease community place great hope in the possibility of a gene therapy, a medical approach that involves modifying a person's genes to treat or prevent their condition. Today, I speak to two individuals from the Czech Republic, Radoslav Haigaida, the chairman and co-founder of the Association of Gene Therapy. Rado founded the Association of Gene Therapy with his wife, Lenka, who are both the parents to a young boy, Oliver, with Angelman syndrome. I then speak to Radislav Sedlacek, a genetic scientist and the director of the Czech Center for Phenogenomics, who explains a little bit about the promise of gene therapies and rare diseases and how they work. Radislav and Rado, thank you for joining me. Hello, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Julian, for taking me on. Thank you very much for joining. So Rado, I would like to begin the conversation with you and learn more about the story of your family. Could you share how your family first learned about your son Oliver's condition, Angelman syndrome? What exactly was that experience like? What was that first moment that you learned he had that condition? Yeah, I would maybe start before uh, we learned that uh, it was our first child. So uh, you don't know uh, how, what, what's the normal progress uh, that children uh, children have uh, while they, uh, are, since they are born, uh, till certain uh, steps in the, in the development. And uh, there were some signs uh, from the family uh, that, okay, uh, maybe something wrong with your child and so on in four months, five months. And when the baby is not turning from uh, from his back uh, on the on the belly and uh, etc. These steps which are uh, looked after by the physicians and so on when you go with a, with the child for the, for the checks uh, by doctors. So we knew that something uh, is not... Uh, going well but you still uh live in hope okay uh we will make it up and uh we will still have a beautiful son but uh, about uh one year uh, of this uh not progressing uh led us to the physicians and to neurologists and we make a circle of the a lot of different examinations and uh, we ended up uh, to be uh, genetically tested uh, to point out uh, what's wrong with our son after about uh Two and a half months uh, waiting for the for the results, we found out uh, that uh, it is uh, Angelman syndrome. We didn't even uh, heard about uh, such a diagnosis. Okay, so we got the answer. What was it? Because we are we were very after to get diagnosis because uh, you are fighting something and you don't know what it is. So at least uh, you have to know your enemy uh, when you want to fight something. So okay, so she she wrote down. Uh, this diagnosis, they hanged up uh, with the arrangement for the next meeting. And uh, she called me uh, on the phone. I was on job. And uh, yeah, she told, uh, she told me it's Angerman syndrome and uh, that she put it in the, in, the, in the Google. And she found uh, that it is not very uh, bright future for us. So I quit on my job. I went home that day. And uh, yeah. You quit uh, that day? Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> I quit that day and uh, come back uh, to my wife and son uh, to digest such a news. When you read it uh, directly uh, without any uh, nice words around it, any any support, uh, and you read it on your own, this diagnosis, it's, uh, yeah, it's like uh, breaking the house of cards. Uh, you are building a new family. You, you, you buy the flat in a, in, a, yeah. in a big city. You have the nice jobs, both of you, and uh, you are looking at the bright future. And uh, this uh, makes your life uh, scattered. Right. That's a really heavy moment that you and your family would have gone through. What did you find out Angelman syndrome to be? Of course, you mentioned that when you learned of that syndrome and that diagnosis, you did Googling. But over time, I imagine you must have been informed more about the condition. But could you maybe outline what are its main symptoms? What are the challenges it presents to someone with the condition or to the family of someone with the condition? And do you know what it's caused by genetically? 
Yes, uh, the symptoms. Symptoms are that uh, your child can reach the mental level of around uh, three years old. So it means you will have the, your child will be the child uh, forever. Yeah. And I don't mean that uh, it, it, it can reach the, the mental level of three years uh, in, a, in a span of three years. It means for the lifetime. Wow. Uh, he got the epilepsy and he don't speak. This uh, are, yeah, he doesn't sleep. These uh, children uh, don't need so much uh, sleep, and it's uh, quite heavy on the on the family. They sleep two three hours a, a night. Wow! And needs uh, twenty four hours guidance, uh, somebody to look uh, after them. He cannot uh, eat on he, on his own. Uh, he don't walk uh, very well. He got the uh, motorics. Uh, he can he is able to walk but a lot of uh, other children with this uh, sim- syndrome in the later age uh, they use the wheelchair right so that's something what, what you can spot uh, on, on these child and on the first side but on the other end he's uh, always happy he <laughs> has a good mood uh, that's why it is this syndrome is nicknamed uh, as an angel child <laughs> They are always happy, smiling. They are uh, they are very how you say it uh, uh, social. Yeah, and they come uh, to so, to some uh, to, to some strange uh, strangers. So they they are friends with everybody, <laughs> and uh, they make the they make uh, the people uh, smile uh, when they are in their uh, at uh, <laughs> together with uh, with this child. And how's he doing this week? Just out of curiosity, is Ollie doing well? <laughs> and how yes. old is he? How old is he today? He's uh, six and a half. I see, but he's doing well. Yes, he's doing well. Uh, if he just needs the laugh, and uh, he will, uh, he will give you laugh back. No, that's good to hear. So, do you know what the genetic cause of the condition is, or do you know what gene causes the condition? Obviously, I know you're not a clinician or a scientist, but might you have some familiarity with the the genetic cause of the condition? Yeah, you when you when you learn this diagnosis, you you study a lot. Yeah. Uh, so you learn uh, genetics uh, as a as on, on the level of first grade or second grade of, uh, yes. of medicine. Uh, so yeah, you you study a lot about genetics, and uh, in our case, uh, they are they are now number of the of variants of how this uh, condition can happen in our case it is a deletion of the number of the genes main of them it's uh, called uh, UB3A right and it's called uh, for ubiquitin uh, and yeah in our case it is deletion but there are other uh, mechanisms how this uh, can happen as it can be a mutation in this gene as well it can be only parental uh, disomy. It means that you get a doubled uh, gene uh, from uh, from one parent, in, uh, from the father. In this case, it could happen. But the output, uh, it's all the same. It's maybe uh, important to say uh, that most of the time it happens uh, de novo. It means uh, there is no uh, no inheritance of this uh, disease from the from the parents. Right. I see. Oh, interesting. So if I'm healthy, my wife is healthy, and uh, there is no predisposition uh, on uh, both of our uh, families. And uh, yeah, it's like uh, winning a lottery. I see. Okay, well, that's an interesting way to put it. And I hadn't realized that about that particular syndrome. So of course, as we all know, there have been very rapid advancements in the world of genetics and gene therapies. Do you happen to know if there are any promising scientific advancements in research or in medicine related to Angelman syndrome that have given hope to your family or to others? Are there any treatments that exist or that you hope to see exist that are gene therapies? Yeah, in the time uh, when we learned the uh, diagnosis, uh, we went uh, through the through the all information we could gather all around the world. Uh, there is a research uh, in the time it was a uh, research running in Japan. Uh, there was a uh, research running in uh, in Netherlands, uh, in America. There were even uh, some uh, clinical trials on the, some uh, kind of uh, treatments. From from the beginning, it was a uh, more uh, more traditional treatments, as, uh, chemical uh, substances, and the research was ongoing also on the on possibilities of the gene therapies. What we learned in the time uh, is that a number of these uh, preclinical or clinical uh, trials, which were started, ended up be- being uh, not successful. 
but the fundamentals of the research uh, which these trials have been based on were not wrong. I see. So uh, that's where we came to idea to join the the forces uh, with uh, with the scientists uh, here in Czech Republic. Uh, namely, the, we approached the Academy of Science and uh, they directed us uh, to the Radislav Sedlacek uh, Center, which is uh, named the Czech Center for Phenogenomics, where they. Uh, were busy uh, creating, describing the functions of the of the genes uh, in, the, in the mammals. So they do that, uh, do it on uh, their everyday uh, basis. Uh, that's their their main task. Uh, in, uh, and uh, we found it uh, that uh, it will match uh, the making uh, models for the rare diseases. It's basically their everyday job. So that's how we find a, found a way uh, we can uh, work on the on something uh, we need because when you are parent of the of the child with a rare disease you have a lot of uh, a lot of questions but uh, two less uh, answers and uh, only yeah. ones who can give you these answers are the scientists. Yeah, absolutely. You're not the first story we've heard of a of a parent of someone with a rare genetic condition ultimately doing so much of their own studying into uh, into genetics that they probably could qualify some sort of qualification as well. But can you talk about how Ollie's condition motivated your and your family's establishment of the Association of Gene Therapy in Prague? And can you talk a little bit about your latest Gene Age exhibition? These, I think, are really interesting projects, which of course have been set up given your, your family's background and experiences. So it'd be interesting to learn more. Yeah, uh, my son's condition uh, what what we spoke uh, with my wife is we approached the scientists uh, in our uh, beginnings. Uh, I believe within uh, 14 days uh, we learned the diagnosis. Within uh, one and a half year, because uh, yeah, what we what we need uh, we need to understand uh, the basics uh, of this uh, disease to be able to treat it in the future. And uh, the best uh, way is to replicate kind of a uh, disease of the of the human on the on the on the animal what you can uh, test it on if you are after finding the cure so that's uh, that's uh, led us to the founding of the association of the of gene therapy where we aim to to join the maybe sometimes uh, not very well uh, co-working groups as are the patients uh, doctors physicians and the scientists in the basic research because the basic uh, research is kind of uh, not really a tangible uh, or understood part of the science for the general public so we want on our own uh, Example, now family example, uh, we want to explain the public and to, to join the public and the basic science uh, in the way uh, to explain uh, how important it is to support the basic science. Because yeah. the, without the basic science, uh, without the basic research, we won't be able to have the uh, to have the any treatments, to have the application research, to have the clinical trials, preclinical trials, and uh, the at the end uh, the treatments uh, for the diseases uh, we cannot treat at the moment. And uh, regarding the exhibition, uh, yeah. it's, it's, it, it is something uh, physical. It's the panel exhibition, uh, which the, in the form of the Panels replicating the the shape of the DNA helix. Yeah, where you have the panels with the text, as the QR codes uh, explaining the basics uh, in genetics uh, on the examples of the rare diseases. The genetics uh, count uh, in the lives of every one of us, and uh, this gives the real life uh, feel of the genetics, how they influence our lives and what we can do about it. I see. No, it's a really interesting exhibition and one with an important goal. So it's at this point I would actually like to speak to Radislav Sedlicic because I'd be interested in learning more about why genetics is important for pretty much well, the vast majority of rare diseases, which of course have a genetic basis. So my first question to you, Radislav, is why do genetics play such a crucial role in the field of rare diseases? And what makes understanding the genetic basis of rare conditions so important? Right. Thank you for this question. So, I mean, this is almost obvious, right? So, um, 
every genetic rare disease has a causative gene, right? So because, um, and this is very, very interesting, how we are able now to define these this genes, because, um, yeah, the sequencing of the humans is ongoing, and we are getting more and more information. And then based on this um, sequence based, sequencing-based diagnostics, we can really uh, find out the causative genes. Sometimes we, of course, reveal um, mutations and we do not know whether it's causative or not. It's just a mutation. And in this case, we are um, getting a request from the doctors for um, such a center, uh, which are asking, so hey, so we have this mutation, so, uh, but we are not really sure whether there's this causative one or not. Can you replicate it in a, in a mouse model? Telling this, we are focus or engage with the gene function. So, and, and we have really like a uh, pipeline uh, ger- generating models for uh, finding the gene function for every gene, right? And and um, based on this, we will very soon have almost encyclopedia of gene function. And then, of course, then if we identify a notation, we can very, very quickly say it's an um, important one or not. And this, uh, we do not have, in general, we do not have only the sequences of the whole human genome. We will now the, very soon the uh, function of every gene. And we would be able to say uh, which mutation cause what. That's very, very interesting because nowadays we know something like 7,000 diseases, uh, genetic diseases, however, only a subset, maybe 600, they have some treatment. Meaning treatment means um, not curation, right? So I consider this a huge, maybe I would say playground for all researchers that would like to to join forces to uh, look into details and map the mechanisms how the mutated genes are causing such diseases. So, I mean, it's obvious that some mutations are causing problems uh, at the level of proteins that cannot play a correct role at the level of proteins. They cannot be uh, various uh, biochemic pathways run in and this cause the disease. I see. And of course, everything you said does make sense. But then moving to the question of how to address a genetic disease, of course, there's been lots of discussion about gene therapies, even though it's a a quite small minority of, of rare conditions that actually receive a gene therapy at this point. But can you provide maybe an overview of the various types of gene therapies that exist to treat genetic conditions and how might they be used to address rare genetic disorders? Right. So, of course, uh, these therapies, they got some development, right? At the first, uh, at the first I think there were cell therapies in which um, the healthy cells were um, engrafted to the to the patients. It could be uh, could be autologous. Uh, okay, I mean autologous. They came later. At first, they was from other healthy people, causing a lot of uh, problems. Then, of course, then we have a, a cell and gene therapy. So, um, and this is uh, coming together because uh, quite often we can uh, manipulate cells, correct them. Uh, using the uh, gene therapy and then and graph them back. So um, typically, we might have a gene therapy in which we can deliver it, uh, the gene or correction tools directly to the body. Or in certain other diseases, uh, we can consider taking from the patient cells, manipulate them ex vivo, correct them, control them, and bring them typically back. So this is typical for uh, hematologic disorders uh, where all the uh, systems and technologies are established, like in transfusion. But instead of transfusion, we can t- take the uh, lymphocytes, correct them, or equip them with uh, new receptors like T-cell receptors, make them specific for tumors, for instance, and then bring them back to the, to the patients. Of course, this is um, this is only manageable for uh, hematologic disorders. Uh, if we have disorders uh, in, the, in a central nervous system, like brain, that's more difficult, right? So, um, because uh, this is not only about the gene therapy uh, but how to, de- this is also the question, how to deliver the correct cell therapy to the cells in the organ on tissues. And of course, they must, uh, this uh, this delivery must be efficient because if we correct one cell, it doesn't help. We correct 10,000 cells, probably still not enough. So we need to have a very good, efficient uh, delivery system 
And then still all those cell and gene therapy are still at the beginning. Currently, the most of the therapies are going direction delivery of a healthy gene, meaning we are not delivering the whole gene. We are taking just the, the parts that are activating the protein, because otherwise, in, in many cases, the genes are very large and would be difficult to deliver them. And this is the limitation of the current, for instance, uh, viral vectors like the uh, adeno-associated uh, viruses. So regarding delivery, uh, there they are other problems. So we could add the correction tools or genes to viruses like uh, lengthy viruses for hematologic disorders or mostly AAVs, this adeno-associated viruses. But uh, they might be a too small to deliver a correction tools based on the CRISPR-Cas uh, genome editing. So altogether, it's quite complicated, and we cannot use one general therapy for everything. We need to consider the gene, its expression, the gene organization uh, in the body, the delivery system, organs, and so on. So um, that's a, a very huge uh, and complex work, but uh, it's manageable uh, with all the tools we know and with all the technologies we. Uh, that appeared in the last uh, couple of years. Interesting. No, that makes sense. And yeah, it's clearly a very complicated area of science, which requires lots of precision when it comes to arriving at a therapy. Are there any particular examples of successful gene therapy applications in the field of rare diseases that you find especially promising or inspiring? Or have there been any recent advancements that you find notable? Right. I mean, uh, the development is really fantastic. Um, so there are more than 30 therapies approved by FDA and maybe several hundreds under development. And um, maybe some of the people notice there are a couple of therapies available also in, in, in clinics. Unfortunately, they are quite expensive. So uh, just an example, there's a, a therapy called Sintaglo. It's gene therapy for beta thalassemia. And uh, this is uh, specific conditions caused by mutated beta globin. And uh, the patients that uh, need to be uh, or are going for this therapy are so-called uh, transfusion-dependent beta thalassemia patients. So these patients are going very often to transfusions, maybe a couple of uh, two to five times a week. So they, they are getting a lot of therapies a year, maybe up to 700 transfusions. And um, according to the data coming from US, the life cost for therapy is like a $5.4 million. Uh, so it's a huge, uh, huge cost, right? And the company Bluebeards Bio developed this integral as a one-time ex vivo gene therapy that would replace all the transfusions. That's pretty fantastic progress, but of course, also such a therapy might have uh, problems. There's also now a therapy called, uh, which is called uh, Zolkinsma. This is for spinal muscle atrophy uh, treatment, which is a group of, of uh, neuromuscular disorders, and is specifically caused by a gene co uh, which is named survival motor neuron one and um, again the trap is based on the viral vectors av vector which delivers a functional human sm one gene to the uh, patients via a single intravenous infusion. And there's a couple of other, uh, other successful therapies. The problem is here that the current therapies, gene based, are very expensive. That's probably understandable, but still, as I told you in the case of Zintegla, and this is valid also for the others, the single phase therapy would still be cheaper than the long long life therapy for for this for such a patients, right? But I believe that during a time it would be possible to to decrease the cost uh, uh, for this therapy and uh, to make them available for almost every patient. Interesting. Actually, if I may ask on that, what gives you confidence that over time actually it should become more financially possible to be able to provide these therapies to more and more patients? What fills you with confidence on that front? Because of course, right now gene therapy therapies are incredibly expensive. What leads you to be relatively optimistic when it comes to the long-term price of these gene therapies becoming more reasonable? Right. I believe that um, the one of the ways is the uh, kind of engagement of uh, maybe two to three pillars. It could be academic sphere, it could be the companies, 
and could be the other hospitals. And uh, it might be that um, that for the cost of the clinical trials, we are cutting down the, the, the experimental therapies. Of course, it would be would mean maybe the changing of paradigm of, of the um, treatments, uh, kind of decentralization, bringing it down to the uh, specialized hospitals. So then probably, I think, in the future, uh, it might be one zero less in the cost of such a therapies. But um, it's probably not for every therapy. So it might be one possibly would be um, hematologic um, uh, disorders where the patients, uh, they have uh, transplantations and oh, yeah, this is actually very, very close to such a uh, development. Of course, they are very hard to solve therapies for for the patients uh, suffering with um, a brain or central nervous disorders. And because th there's a there's a limit in the biology, so um, this, we, we would need at first a very soon diagnostics of all, all diseases, specifically of the brain uh, disorders. And uh, if you do not correct the genes or, or problems coupled with the, uh, them, then it's pretty difficult to uh, ensure that uh, the brain and CNS develop in a fully functional physiological way. So, um, but uh, other organs like a uh, liver, blood, skin, I think uh, we still might be very efficient with applying such a, uh, gene therapies and, and others as well. No, thanks, Radislav. You've broken things down very clearly there. That, that's very interesting. I'd like to complete the conversation by returning back to Rado. Rado, as a parent of a child with Angelman syndrome, you've had, of course, a unique perspective on the challenges and hopes associated with dealing with a rare genetic disease diagnosis, especially one, of course, which doesn't yet have a gene therapy. Given your interests in the effort to find a gene therapy, the efforts to bring about some form of, of treatment for the condition that gets to the, the root of the condition. Can you share any personal insights or advice for other families who may be in a similar situation to yours? Uh, general progress in the, in the molecular biology. This Nobel uh, Prize winning uh, inventions as a CRISPR technology, which are now here and uh, these are the tools uh, scientists uh, dreamed about and now we can do uh, things we could not uh, 10 years ago and uh, about the uh, hope uh, the hope it's not a conviction uh, conviction that something uh, will turn out well but the uh, certainty is that something makes sense regardless uh, of how it will turn out i mean uh, our son uh, will not uh, benefit from the research uh, which we uh, which we are doing uh, now what we initiated and our scientists are busy but uh, next generations uh, could there is still hope uh, that uh, in uh, such a immense uh, progress for the science is doing at the moment could help also to our son but uh, we are not uh, so selfish uh, and we like to do it uh, for the maybe for the next generations. And indeed, that's why your organization has set up the Gene Age exhibition, which is addressing rare genetic diseases of all sorts. Could you remind us where people can learn more about your Gene Age exhibition? Yeah, the Gene Age exhibition uh, will travel through eight cities uh, in Czech Republic. You can uh, look at it on uh, on English uh, web page. It's uh, www.geneh.org. Uh, there is an English version. There is a quiz uh, with questions. When you fill in the quiz, uh, our sponsor will donate uh, some amount of money uh, to the research for every quiz filled in. And uh, these uh, materials uh, regarding the exhibition will be available uh, freely to any organization or individuals uh, who will be interested to translate it in their language or uh, use the English version or uh, whatever. I hope at the end of the next year when the exhibition will end up, it's uh, it's traveling uh, within the Czech Republic. It will be moved to some foreign countries uh, which can serve its purpose as well. Well, hopefully so. And hopefully it does a successful job, which I'm sure it will, of raising awareness about the promise of gene therapies for many different rare diseases. And of course, not just Angelman syndrome. Rado and Radislav, thank you so much for joining me for this discussion. Thank you for having us here. Thank you, Julian, for inviting us.